our session on online to offline commerce. We have a few people in the back here getting mic'd up and we'll get started and get into introductions in a second. So to start off, a few kind of opening remarks on what we're doing here today. So this session is largely based on a data point that has been really gaining steam in the last five years or so in local, which is that despite all of the attention paid to e-commerce over the last decade or so, it only really accounts for about 7% of retail spending. The rest, the vast majority, all happens offline brick and mortar. Now, I usually add to that data point another reality, which is that if you add local services, 100% of which happen offline, we're talking home services, professional services, the total offline spending um, is more like 96% of total US uh, consumer spending. So the question after all of that is, how do you effectively drive all that offline purchase behavior and transactions, and also track and attribute it correctly. So that's essentially what all of these guys are attacking from very different angles, but all um, among that same umbrella of that challenge of online to offline attribution, driving commerce, measuring it, and all that stuff, and it's quickly changing. Um, so we still have John back there getting mic'd up. Nice, good timing. Um, so what we'll do now is I'll have each of you guys introduce yourselves. Um, for about 60 seconds, talk about your companies yourself, and then we'll dive deeper, of course, um, and get into this and take some audience questions uh, over the next 30 minutes. So John, why don't you go first? Sure. So morning, everybody. Um, my company's name is Empire, and we are focused on sort of bridging the gap of online to offline using card-linked offers. So what that is is the credit and debit cards are already in your wallet. Once you link them up to one of our publishers, websites, or apps, you just simply use those that now we have tens of thousands of merchants across the country and sort of instantly you get notified that you earned a reward, like a cash back or points or something to that effect. Um, no friction, no handing over a coupon, no buying a voucher in advance. Sort of takes a lot of that friction out, which I'm sure we'll talk about. And uh, today we, we're just a platform, so we work with websites and apps like coupons.com, Microsoft, just about to announce something with Yelp that mm -hmm. we'll talk a little bit about today. Um, so anybody that has a website or app would be a good partner, or anybody that works with merchants that wants to bring them onto the platform. Excellent. Very well. Go ahead, good Tracy. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Tracy Manning. I work with XAD. Uh, we're the largest mobile location-based advertising and intelligence platform. Um, we're very focused on using location data to help get people to a better place, and that's vague on purpose. Mm -hmm. So uh, that means the end consumer, advertisers, our media partners, even our own employees. Yep. Thank you, Tracy. Chris, I feel like you guys are about 30 feet away. If you can hear me over there. Yeah. You're next, Chris. Hi, uh, Chris Cunningham from Newton, Massachusetts. So good to be back in hometown. Started my career in 99 with this guy to my right um, with a company called Music Vision. Fun fact, so nice to be on stage with Steve. Um, our company is called Unicast. We're, uh, we're building the physical world graph. Um, by aggregating beacon and sensor deployments. So it's a highly fragmented ecosystem of hundreds of companies that deploy physical hardware software. So that's our methodology that we focus on. And we aggregate and ingest that data and harmonize it and put in pack, uh, segments for commercial use, generally retargeting and attribution. Well done, Steven. We had a good time back then. Uh, <laughs> uh, Steven Rosenblatt, president of Foursquare. I've uh, been with the company for um, almost five years. And uh, Foursquare is the world's leading location intelligence company. Our uh, location intelligence powers our consumer apps, which many of you, I'm sure, know and, and hopefully use, uh, which is Foursquare City Guide, which is the search and discover app, and, and Foursquare Swarm, which is our check-in app. Uh, from that, we've built uh, enterprise um, products that where we work with marketers, developers, um, you name it, uh, companies all across the ecosystem, uh, helping them plan, reach, measure, and we also power um, pretty much every major tech company's uh, location platform from Snapchat to Uber, Twitter, and so on. So uh, it's Foursquare. Thanks, Stephen. So I want to drill down a little bit further on each of your business models, really to kind of set the stage and provide some context that I think will really frame all the discussions and everything you say uh, for the next 25 minutes or so. So essentially, and I think John, you already did a good job explaining this, what I'm looking for is you know, where you sit in the value chain. Um, you know, who are your customers and your constituents and who pays you? Like for example, Steven, you guys have consumer apps, so you're consumer facing. That's how you get all that great data, synthesize it, package it, 
and then sell that to various entities who are looking for gleaning location intelligence. So that's the type of stuff I'm looking for from each of you guys. Um, John, I think you probably already described that, but who pays you? Um, you mentioned some examples of that already. Yeah, so, so we get paid, in essence, by, um, by the merchant. So, yeah. so my little ball came off. Um, and the merchant uh, is typically working on our platform through a channel partner. So somebody who already has a lot of relationships with local businesses and also national businesses. Yeah. They pay us because what we do is we help them get on some of the best websites and apps on the internet where yeah. consumers are looking for local deals or local content in general. And they get on those websites and apps, they don't pay for the impressions, they don't pay for the clicks. They only pay when somebody links up a card and walks in and buys from them. So it's kind of like, we like to say it's the first um, sort of cost per revenue for offline businesses mm -hmm. online. Sort of like an online to online affiliate programs have been around for a while. Now we're doing online to offline affiliate programs where we only pay per sale. So that's who basically pays the bill. And when they pay the bill, what happens is um, some of that is shared with the consumer. There's sort of this value chain. So the consumer yeah. that comes in, they get a cash back or points reward. Um, whoever got the consumer to link up their card and go in, so for example, if, uh, our relationship with Yelp, if you saw the offer on Yelp, linked up your card there and walked in, Yelp would earn a piece of that transaction as well, and whoever brought on the merchant, so if it was a channel partner that had a relationship with that merchant that got them to join the platform, they would earn a percentage of that transaction as well. So the business only pays for the transaction, and then that money is distributed to the consumer, the publisher that brought the consumer on, and the channel partner. Mm -hmm brought the advertiser on. Sure. So the advertiser pays you, but it's also very important to have the user as a constituent because yeah. without them, you don't have something to kind of sell along. So that's interesting. And we'll get into that too in terms of serving two masters and the challenge in doing that. <laughs> yeah. But um, Tracy, so Exad actually has lots of constituents in being both an ad network, a technology provider, yes. publishers, advertisers. So how does that all come together? Yeah, absolutely. So we're plugged into the supply side via both the exchanges and direct relationships to a lot of premium publishers. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's sort of you know, how our, our ad network itself is built. Um, and from there, we receive the ad calls that have location attached to them from all the apps that are part of those networks or publishers that have, um, through privacy compliant ways, sought permission to collect that location data and use it for purposes of advertising and or insights. Mm -hmm. so, um, so we receive, you know, billions and billions of ad calls on, of a, on, a, on a monthly basis. Um, and then, you know, obviously go through a process of sort of, you know, weeding those down because not all location data is created equal. Whole nother, of course. Whole, whole nother issue. Um, and we'll then, be getting into that, don't yeah, worry. Yeah, so we're, we're paid by the advertiser, but that could be, we have direct brand relationships, we have agency relationships, and then we also work with the channel side for SMB. So mm -hmm. um, we kind of have all those constituents to serve. Um, and largely they're paying, you know, for the advertising itself, right? Yep, of um, and we're getting a cut of that with the publisher getting the other cut. Mm -hmm. Everyone knows the way that works in the ecosystem. Of course. Uh, but increasingly as we're moving more towards intelligence and insights, um, I think we'll see that model change significantly. We already are seeing that change. Mm -hmm. So Chris, you guys are federating Beacon Networks. You're working with the Beacon providers. You're also working with lots of different kind of parts of that value chain. So mm -hmm. explain that a little bit further. Sure. So yeah, I mentioned earlier there are about 350 companies um, that deploy beacons and sensors. And what's exciting about that is it offers a very deterministic signal because obviously with physical hardware pinging your phone, um, first party or third party app, we know without question that you entered back into store. Uh, it also has the hope of telling, telling somebody that you're in aisle seven um, shopping for men's shoes. So the power around uh, hardware and software deployment is um, the, the accuracy story. So proximity is very much how we hang our hat. The way we make money, there's three different ways, but one primary way today. Demand side players, um, any media publisher, mo uh, mobile company, owned and operated, it could be a Pinterest, it could be a Pandora, it could be a DSP like MediaMath. Uh, they're looking for highly accurate location data, uh, specifically proximity. Um, and they'll, they'll, uh, they'll use our data from a sort of an ongoing SaaS relationship in which they onboard segments, and then they package that data for their own commercial use. So very similar to you know, data, data logics from a transactional perspective and what Blue Kai built for, for the, uh, the online cookie. We're a data company. We're, we don't run media. We don't run impressions. We actually don't even have privy to that unless they pass us back that data. Our role is aggregate and collect the best possible signal and then put it on a silver platter for third parties to tap into it. The future revenue stream that's still under development is giving brands the ability to monetize um, or retarget their own consumer. 
Nice. Steve and I were chatting about this yesterday, but there's, there's obviously a ton of first party data that sits with brands and retailers. And unfortunately, a lot of them aren't putting that data to use. You look at Macy's, they shut down 100 stores. What could they have done better? There's Amazon out there eating everyone's lunch. So the hope is that more brands and retailers understand that they have to release first party data to create mm -hmm. net new revenue stream. We hope to be a, a part of that equation. And it goes beyond just marketing. That data can be useful in logistics, inventory management, all kinds of other stuff that we'll get into. And Steven, you're actually, you know, in terms of the companies you're working with, it's not just marketing. You're working with um, investment research analysts to provide that kind of great data for that. So I guess along the same lines of this same question, um, you know, what are the companies you're working with and how's that evolving? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's evolved in a big way. I mean, we're working with everyone from, you know, about over a third of the ad age, uh, top 100 large marketers that are buying our media products to help, again, reach um, consumers with that, uh, you know, our, our just massive understanding of the world, all driven and powered by that, that consumer data we have. Um, our measurement product. So we launched a research product to help marketers measure uh, whether their digital advertising is actually driving consumers in store real time. So it's not survey based, we don't incentive, it's not, not incentivized. Um, and we've really fundamentally changed the dynamics of measurement, the ability to, you know, every day by creative, by publisher, understand that working. So again, that's, you know, typically marketers. We work with, there's 100,000 developers, and that, that's everyone from, you know, Joe in his garage who's starting a company to Uber, Snapchat, Pinterest. Twitter, Samsung, Microsoft, Apple, you name it, that are customers of ours that are using our data to power experiences within their own ecosystem. It could be making their maps better. It could be uh, if you're tagging a photo or a pin or a tweet that's using Foursquare's data to do that. Snapchat most recently is using us to help them uh, better uh, create geofilters so that those geofilters are accurate. Um, and then as you said, we work, we have a whole intelligence and insights business. We're also working with everyone from Wall Street hedge funds to um, Fortune 500 companies who have to use foot traffic data to make business decisions, whether that's store opening or sales team automation. So lots of customer segments. And of course, we also still you know, work with many local businesses that are using our self-service platform, mostly um, in-app, but that's a small piece of yeah. it. Yeah, so a quick example of some of the data that you guys have released. Um, along the lines of those just kind of really interesting nuggets, where in some cases you even made predictions based on that kind of what you called ground truth data of check-ins happening, and we're able to tell, you know, day one iPhone sales, or that the, you had a kind of hum somewhat humorous Trump one halfway through the campaign. Pick any one of those as an example of kind of some of the stuff you guys are uncovering. Yeah, I mean, it all comes down to, so location is hard, right? If it was easy, Apple and Google would, figure, would have figured it out. It would be precise. What they provide developers would be 100% accurate, um, and everyone would go on their way, but it's not, right? It's not, it won't be. There's a lot of complexity around precise location. Anyone can do geo-targeting within a vicinity, but if you're really truly about reaching someone at a place, near a place, um, at scale, it's, it's, it's a very difficult thing. For us, it all started with consumers 10 billion times. They've hit a button on their phone that said, you know, I'm at this place at, at this specific time. And when doing so, uh, we, we read all the sensors. So we read, you know, if there's Wi-Fi in this building, we read it. If there's a Bluetooth or beacons, we're, we're scanning and reading all that. So now, again, fast forward, we've been doing this for seven years. We have about 105 um, million venues globally all over the world where we understand their digital footprint, right? You can do vertical accuracy then. That's stuff you can't do unless you have the consumer. You have that consumer confirming data or you have beacons, right? And beacons, again, there's, you know, which Chris, you know, does deal with a lot of the scale challenges and, and fragmentation with beacons. But again, the only way to correct for all that inaccuracy is, is consumers correcting it for you. And so that's essentially what we do. We've really, you know, the only other companies that can truly do that, you know, Facebook's been, obviously, they're getting, trying to prompt you more and more to check in. Why? For that very reason, to correct for location inaccuracies. Why is Google asking you to confirm location or they're, they're telling you that, you know, from, they're trying to predict things and to get confirmation? Now, they don't have people checking in, but they have search intent, right? It's a really hard thing to do at scale globally. Um, but again, we've, we've can, you know, we create great consumer products, and in exchange for that, um, that experience that we provide consumers, both actively checking in and passively collecting data, we're able to, to, to leverage and utilize and that. Just to piggyback on that, we're, right. we're, whether it's Foursquare or Unicast or um, you know, Orin's new company, uh, SafeGraph out of LiveRamp, 
Um, there's an opportunity to, to create uh, a truth set. Yeah. So it's very similar to, I think, um, and whoever solves for if there's one player or two players. But I think that's, that's kind of a, that's a, that's a, that's a new revenue stream and opportunity that one of us could solve or two of us, who knows. But the point is, is that what Moat solves for viewability, both on the publisher side and on the brand side, is super powerful. And those guys are, you know, I wish I had shares. Um, but there's, a, there's an opportunity for uh, uh, companies that actually collect a very powerful signal to enable third parties to say, or brands, or publishers to say, is that true? Is yeah. that right? Or how accurate? There's a whole revenue stream in itself right there. Sure. Well, let's stay on that thread. And Tracy, you brought up location accuracy originally. Yes. Um, and I want to drill down a little bit further on kind of the methodology of how you all are kind of collecting that information. And then further bolstering it, like Stephen, as you mentioned, with kind of other you know, nearby, nearby Wi-Fi signals that can append that data and further validate it. And the check-in itself is already pretty accurate. Um, so what are you each doing in terms of you know, differentiating and you know, solving that long-standing challenge of the location accuracy problem? And John, that question probably re um, relates less to you, but you also have attribution data in the fact that you have a transaction, a finished transaction. So perhaps you even have the holy grail of that. So let's start with you in terms of just you know, how you're, you're getting that data and then go down the line. Tracy, I'd love to hear from how you guys are differentiating as well as an ad network. For, to, you've always kind of had more of an accurate signal than the more kind of broad ad networks out there. And there's an interesting story, I think, behind how you guys do that. But John, first you. Sure. So I think it, online to offline in general, it's like there's no silver bullet, right? Like one solution and all of your attribution problems are solved. There's all these great sort of solutions. And I think ultimately the smart companies are deploying multiple solutions. Yeah. Some, some that track locations, some that in our case track transactions. You know, that's, that's one of the things that I think makes this program, you know, Empire so attractive is we take it all the way from I saw an ad online all the way through to I made a transaction. Here's exactly how much I bought. Yeah. I can tell you uh, within, you know, to a second of when you bought and what, how much money you actually spent. And the way we got that was uh, really, really hard. We, we had to work with Visa, MasterCard, and Amex, who, who wasn't very open with sharing their data, yeah. as you can imagine. Um, but first, we worked with TSYS and First Data, and we worked with the, the processors. And that was kind of janky, but it sort of worked. And that's how we launched. And then over about three years, four years, of BD deals and dealing um, PCI compliance and all this stuff to make it work, and lawyers and privacy lawyers, we finally got access to Visa, MasterCard, and Amex transactions in real time. And then the next step was being able to share it you know, with companies like Foursquare, et cetera. And they finally agreed to that about a year later. So it's really brand new that there's the ability for anyone, any publisher out there who has a website or app to be able to um, you know, tap into our API and be able to access transaction data in real time. Yeah. I would say that's maybe a year old yeah. at this point. And I think just, that's just sort of the nature of them becoming more open to sharing. Um, and, now it's, and now it's available. So you can take it all the way through. Now, granted, it's a card-linked offer, so you've got to have sort of the whole program running. But if you do, you can absolutely go to an advertiser and say, look, we're, we can get you out here on the website, on the, on the app, and you only pay when somebody walks in and buys. And here's, like, our dashboard is like, here's impressions that you got online. So you see all those. Here's all the people that came into your store and bought. You had you know, 1,100 customers, and they spent exactly you know, $43,000. Sure. And that closing that loop is just kind of a, a bit of a game changer and, and really powerful. And then below that is every single transaction. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, yeah, that's where we... Well, yeah, so you have the transaction. That's the holy grail. So further up the value chain when we're talking about ad targeting, Tracy, tell us about how XAD is differentiating with respect to a stronger location signal. Yeah, I, I would tell you um, we were probably one of the first companies to start aggressively visualizing the locates that came in, yep. the ad calls that came in. And as we did that, um, because D, our founder, was very passionate about uh, building tech and not building decks, right? Yeah, sure. And so uh, he believed in building tech and then demonstrating it became really, really apparent that there were a couple of huge problems with the quality of location data. One, n not all location data was created equal, and that's for a number of reasons. One can be the methodology in which it's collected. So for example, if an app, say, just collects a user's self-reported zip code at registration or collects it using a current location yeah. feature, I might download an app in San Francisco, and then for the rest of the time I have that app, all the advertising I get is yeah. from San Francisco. And I can name you about five apps where that's actually happened to me. Yeah. Um, the other thing is you know, where the location data came from, the source. So for example, cell tower data, 
course. Um, can be very coarse and, and not very granular at all unless you're maybe an engineer that's been working with it at a wireless carrier for a long time and you know exactly how to interpret that uh, data. And then you just had some bad actors in the ecosystem too that would attach a location to any ad call just to try to get a higher CPM. So we started seeing that visually. Mm -hmm. You could see clusters of locates happening at the centroid of the country or the centroid of a state or the centroid of a DMA. And so we had to develop a lot of algorithms to kind of weed all that out. And essentially yeah. we learned about 70% of location data at one point was bad. Um, and we had to learn what to use and what not to use. The other thing that's really important, and in the early use case of ad serving, this, this wasn't as important, is the accuracy with which you geofence a point of interest. Yeah. Um, so a, the way a lot of companies do it is just throw a radial fence around the postal address or the mailbox. And if you're just serving ads, that's not a big deal because you're trying to bring in more fish, right? Yep. Uh, but when you start to expand to some other use cases that become critically important, things like building audiences based on people's real-time visitation patterns, or building measurement solutions, attribution solutions, for instance, it becomes really important whether you were actually in the store yeah. or you were driving by. And the same is true as it moves towards insights and artificial intelligence. And temporal, too. I mean, were you yes. there yesterday or were you there in the last exactly. five minutes? But I think also, I mean, you're right that it's about having the discipline to throw out the 70% of data that you know is bad. But also, is it fair to say that XAD, as a network, is made up of publishers whose apps are inherently more location-enabled and therefore people Absolutely. are more likely to opt in, which is yes. really the whole, holy grail, is at the app layer having GPS mm -hmm. enabled. Yeah, um, that's been the goal from the start, yeah. really, is to connect to as much of that location-oriented location, location -oriented supply side as mm -hmm. possible. Um, and we've been very aggressive about getting plugged into more and more and more inventory every sure. year. Um, you know, over a very short span, we almost tripled um, our size in, in that area, and, and even our recent acquisition of Weatherbug. Yeah, Weatherbug, absolutely. Is, is largely about that, and of course about also uh, the magical combination of having weather intelligence and location intelligence mm -hmm. together, and the sorts of things that you can start to get to with that, like state of mind. Sure, well, and it's apps like that that you can't really use it without having location on. So it's right. really, is it an organic experience to have location on? I was always joking within the kind of Pokemon Go craze that one of the things they did was that they convinced all of these people to turn on location inherently yes. and what can we all learn from that and it's really about just having that experience mm -hmm. that you know it requires it organically and not as as an ad experience but Chris right. let's move to you in terms of you know how do beacons come into this in having that closed loop and the data but also this opt-in discussion of usually the challenge with a lot of beacon deployments is getting people to turn on Bluetooth turn on push notifications and all these things but we talked about some interesting mm -hmm. macro trends recently like Google's Eddie stone and even kind of Apple's AirPods where mm -hmm. they might compel people to have Bluetooth turned on these other kind of cool factors that may lead to that just higher degree of opt-in yep well certainly like to set the stage and we're I think you know we're always very transparent about it T today isn't the day of like beacon proliferation, mm -hmm. the numbers that I think either you guys reported or some another analyst, it's uh, 500, um, uh, today there are 8 million beacons that mm -hmm. known of today, beacons and sensors, and that's going to 550 million by 2020. So the, the, the growth is definitely happening, but it's not gonna be, again, Steve and I were talking about this the other day, it's not gonna be uh, people in ladders putting beacons up in mm -hmm. things like this, it's gonna be LED, light, LED, LED lighting replacing yep. every retailer, QSR, uh, known to mankind, and all those LED lightings are going to be outfitted with beacons and sensors. It's already mm -hmm. happening. Um, but um, so, you know, and there, there are two macro trends that have happened. Uh, Google's Eddy Stone basically allows beacons to bump in browser. Yep. So that's a huge... No um, third-party download required. Correct. No, no third-party download. download. So, so that, that's definitely lowers the barrier to entry, mm -hmm. which was a big one for, I guess, the Unicast ecosystem uh, a couple years ago. And number two, um, uh, iPhone 7 um, um, wireless um, is another enabler, like Pokemon that you mentioned, where people are not going to think about Bluetooth on and off as much. Yeah. At least we believe that's, that's the trend. So there are macro trends that will enable p um, users to bump into more beacons. Um, I think it's, if you look at it just as a beacon, you're going to see this. But if you look at it as beacons, NFC, NFC, um, the kinds of companies that we're talking to, even out of New York, um, um, that are doing out of home, there are a ton of different signals that can be a that can that can be aggregated and collected, but individually and siloed, it's not that interesting yeah. as it relates to scale or, or marketing purposes. So um, 
you know, a, a, you know, a good kind of case in this as far as the quality of the data, which is we're not a we're we're not going to be a we're not going to be a quantity company. Yeah. We're, we're, Unicast will never be focused on this like massive massive scale. We're going to be much more about the the quality of it. But the but you know, case in point, if we have beacons deployed in a Verizon store, this is a real case study. We run attribution to media that was exposed within that geographic location. People walk back into a Verizon store. There's, no, there's not even a 1% chance that that person, based on where the technology is outfitted, walked by or was it a bus? No, no, they walked back in. Yeah. So it's th those kinds of stories as it relates to solving for um, attribution. So I agree with the earlier point. There's not just a one size fit fits all. Um, but th that's kind of, a, kind of a classic example of how we would help Verizon figure out if somebody mm -hmm. walked back into a store. Steven, in terms of accuracy, I mean, you guys kind of have the holy grail in the actual opt-in in the form of a check-in. Uh, but also, I think you guys do something interesting where you're measuring in the background that kind of um, stop data. What, what's the, the term for it? Stop, yeah, I mean, we, uh, stop, stop analysis. Stop detection. Yeah. Stop detection. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so, so tell us about stop detection as opposed to just kind of measuring anywhere anyone goes. And you might walk by you know, 100 places a day, but that's meaningless. It's the places you stop which really kind of provide context, right? Well, that, that's it. I mean, and I think that's key with our own consumer, you know, panel, right, if you will, our consumer apps. We've built technology, um, you know, all about creating great consumer experiences so we know that if a consumer, you know, you're stopped at a place and you forget to open up your phone, we can recommend great things to you. So that the backbone of that was all built for, for building the yeah. best possible consumer experience. But that ability to understand when a phone is stopped, you can't do that on bitstream data. I mean, it, it just doesn't, you don't, you cannot do that. So you have to be on the phone, in the app, on the, uh, you know, on the device. And so, you know, there are companies out there, they'll say, oh, we see, you know, a thousand stop, a thousand places a day of where people go. Anyone here go to any, any place a thousand times, you know, any thousand places a day? No, you go to like three to five places. So where you stop, is the real signal that's critical. It's critical for marketers, it's critical for Wall Street hedge funds, it's, that's the intense signal, right? You actually took the time to actually go to a place and sit there for you know, one to five minutes. That's more important than we pass by lots of different places, right? So I think that is critical, and that, that took you know, a lot of R&D, a lot of money, a lot of engineering work um, over time to know that you know, you're, you're stopped and then so we can build profiles you know, again based on that and we can do so much of our measurement is based on where people are stopped. And if you don't have the consumer, um, if you're just surveying them or other things, you, know, you get a lot of bias there. We know without asking them, without questioning them, we actually know where their phone is because they yeah. tell us. And, um, and again, after doing this with all the amount of information we have over seven years, that accuracy, that pre precision, that all the sensors that we understand, we know whether you're in the you know, Royale versus whether you're in the Courtyard by Marriott. Yep. You can't do that, and, you know, and, and it drives me crazy because I think anyone who says that they can do that through uh, Bidstream and Addicts, you can't, you, you can't do that. You may know someone's in and around a vicinity, but you can't get that precise. Yeah. You know, what you can pull today, just last comment, Go ahead. you can pull today AID, IDFA, yep. date and timestamp, lat long dwell time. Yep. You know, these are signals that all exist on a unique mobile identifier. If you, ma if you take that ID and you match it with an existing audience, you, there, you can see if you've seen that, you can verify. So the point is there's different methodologies Definitely. to hopefully attain the same end goal, which is a powerful offline yeah. uh, signal. Closing yeah. the loop. Um, we have a few minutes if there are any audience questions. Uh, we have one over here. Is there a, a microphone? Um, Oh, Suzanne, it's actually right behind you. Hi. So I have a question about sort of thinking really local, right? So you've got GovTech kind of developing all this uh, technology to really measure service uh, needs in a community and you know how to make things run better. How do you envision maybe helping those local Main Street uh, businesses? really compete now? Because I think that, you know, there's a lot of community development, and it seems like now they finally have an opportunity to push people into their location. Uh, I don't know if you've done that, or if there's uh, things with the beacons that you're... I mean, I, I can answer. I, I mean, the, the original premise of Foursquare, what our founder, Dennis Crowley, um, had worked on and built a company before and sold to Google, was that premise of how do you 
you know, how do you make incredibly difficult problem? Um, I think it really stems from, um, and we still work with so many small merchants um, who, you know, make sure that their their business information is verified and validated on Foursquare and so on. But I think it really comes down to local merchants. Just they don't know where to start, right? They don't know where to go. They don't. They're not really sure. Um, they themselves are too busy and don't understand uh, how to use technology per se. Um, and so it's it's a tough, tough problem. I'm curious, you know, how you're doing a lot of the um, closed loop offers, especially at local merchants. We used to, years and years ago, we used to have these Amex offers at local merchants. So you check in, you'd have a load to card with Amex only where you can, you know, spend, swipe, and instantly you'd save money just from going there. And to scale that, the problem was we couldn't scale, like to scale that was impossible, right? Because it was just Amex, it wasn't the other credit card companies, local merchants were, didn't, you'd walk in, local merchants were like, wait, what? I, I never, you know, the, the clerk and the cashier had no idea what you were talking about. So, you know, there's, we got a long way to go, <laughs> I think is a simple way to say it. So John, I want to let you respond to that, but first I think it's also uh, to kind of play off what you said, Stephen. Um, it's about taking all of this to the next step and using all the data to be more predictive. And we're starting to see that um, through kind of the onset of AI. We're starting to see even companies like Uber to know where you've been, where you're going, and start to recommend you know, what you might like next. And uh, John, we've even talked about this in, in light of your upcoming Yelp announcement, but first I want to let you respond uh, to kind of Stephen's comments and anything you want to say to answer the question as well. Yeah, sure. So today the bulk of what we do is the local business owner. We help them. We have about 10,000 that are on the platforms, which is starting to scale really nicely. Um, and, and we help them in the sense, I agree with what Stephen says, they, they don't know what to do. And, and online marketing is so vast, like which channels do I choose? And then even when they do advertise on Google or one of these platforms, they're buying clicks or impressions, and then they don't know how many sales that's actually generating. So this is really challenging. Thing. Do I keep doing that? I'm spending you know, 700 bucks a month on Google. I know I need to be there. Am I making money? And we've sort of simplified all of that for them. And, and we just say, you know, again, come on to the platform. We're going to put you on great websites and apps that you know you need to be on, like, like Yelp, like coupons, like even, even like Google, potentially. We're, we're in talks with them. And ultimately, you're only going to pay when somebody walks in and, and buys from you. So it's just a sale that you're paying for. So it just simplifies everything for them. And there, there's also no friction in it. So the person just walks in and buys like they normally do. It just swipes their card. And nobody knows. If it's a restaurant, the server doesn't have to be trained. Nobody has to be trained. It just happens in the background. So it's just sort of this program that they say, yeah, I want to do that. And then they just start, you know, they're basically buying revenue. So I think it helps them quite a bit. And, and to Stephen's point as well about scale, I mean, that, that, that's why it's taken us five years and we've raised about $40 million and we're still scratching the tip of the iceberg. It's very difficult to get a lot of local merchants on the platform. It's also difficult to get a lot of consumers to participate in a program like this. So once we turned in, we used to try to do this all ourselves with a brand called Mogul, which was direct to consumer. And then we were like, nope, this is impossible to scale on our own. We're going to turn it into a platform. And so now with the firepower, consumer power that companies like Yelp and others have, and, and a lot of the channel partners that we work with at conferences like this that can bring on thousands of merchants themselves, now it's starting to, to get to that scale. And I think for us, the next level of how we really help the local merchant is actually combining the two data sets. So, like, for example, like we, we'll probably end up you know, working with Foursquare or in, in some respect to capture the location data. So the nirvana is I'm walking down the street, I walk past a restaurant, you know, I, I get that location data from their phone. I know that this person loves sushi and they typically eat sushi at Thursday nights at 7.30 and it's now 7 o'clock and they're right next to a sushi restaurant serve them up a push notification, text message, email that says, hey, there's a great sushi restaurant right next to you. It's well rated. And uh, just walk in and buy and get your reward. You see that, you know, you see that it's perfect because at that point there's no friction. You just, you've already linked up your card to whatever program years ago or months ago. You just walk in and buy. Yeah. And that's sort of the perfect thing. You capture them when they're moving through their life. Offer them something that, that they actually want at the time of that they actually want it, the place that they actually want it, and make it so they just walk in and buy. Mm -hmm. That, for me, is, is really what we're focused on this next year. And I think 
that creates just a really compelling experience. And that gets to, Tracy, what you were talking about in the audience targeting. Yes. It's about ads, not just where I am now, but what were the last 50 places I was at, and That's what does right. that say about me as a consumer that you know that I like sushi and I'm nearby? So it's not just that one location signal, but the last 50 location signals also mm -hmm. to basically be that predictive engine. Go ahead, Chris. No, I was just, I, I was just think the slight uh, counter, not counter, I, just, mm -hmm. I think, I feel like the, the, the obvious application is look back on audience. Sure. Because I just, I, I, I see that as a, I think brands looking for audiences that have been is a, or, or the attribution example, seem like very natural paths. I, I for one, just given, I guess, my own life and kind of own that, that interaction doesn't seem real to me. Mm -hmm. The idea of like, boom, I'm gonna change the court, I'm like, I'm on a phone call, I'm running to something, I'm late, and all of a sudden I'm gonna kind of change my plans to have dinner. That's true. So uh, it's not that I'm challenging, I, I think it's an yeah. interesting conversation about what's mm -hmm. the reality of people behaving like that. Interesting. Because yeah. I don't know people that behave like that. They book dinner with their friends at eight and, yeah. you know, or they're like, two, they're on conference calls because they don't, and they, they're walking into people because they're staring at their phone. I just don't know if that kind of like, boom, there's something there, you're like, I'm gonna change my course. Yeah, I don't know if I subscribe life, to that. I actually tested this. And sure, and it's a, it's a question it's, of, This is more of a question. I, I like your wrong. point, because yeah. this is a, more, I just, I'm yeah. trying to understand that. I like your point, because it's a question of, you know, what percentage of our moments are impressionable? And maybe there's a data set to overlay that says, during these times, I might be more serendipitous. Um, and I think that has a lot to do with it. Because you bring up a good point. That's the mind piece I'm talking about yeah, yeah. before. You know, if I'm at a restaurant near my house at 10.30 at night that also serves alcohol and it's beautiful weather out, right? I'm in one state of mind versus it's rainy, I'm in a noodle shop next to my work at, from 12 to 12.15. I'm just in a different state of mind. What yeah. you can say to me and what I'm likely to do on impulse Completely yeah. different. This is, this, and this is where I think, it's a great point, and this is where I think artificial intelligence is going to play a really key role because you need to test every time and, and all the weather conditions and the location and all the previous purchase behavior. You need to get all that data in there, and you need to start testing and testing and testing. And eventually, that's why I like AI, because machine learning would learn, okay, it's not 7 o'clock that you tell them about a sushi restaurant at 7.30. It's actually this kind of weather. It's actually 6.15 because you've got to catch them earlier. Or it's the day before at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And, uh, and they have to have at least bought sushi you know, four times because three times or less, they're not going to want sushi or something like that, right? It, you've got to grab all the data. Absolutely, you can influence people's behavior with, with saving money on something they already want to do. Yeah. But how do you capture them at the time that they want to do that is really complex and, and probably isn't something as simple as just a recommendation sure. engine. It's probably AI. Well, of one one John, proxy. I think it makes sense in this example, because this happened a few weeks ago. I, I was stuck in, I had a window in LA where I'm like, I couldn't find my friends that like live in Santa Monica or whatever. I kind of had this like weird three hour window before a red eye. In that particular moment, if the data as it relates to my Delta flight connected to- There you go. That's interesting, because yeah. I literally was walking down Venice Beach with my wheel bag being like, where, what do I do? Yeah, yeah. And my buddies were like, thanks for notice. Like, no, you know, we don't like you. Good luck with your flight <laughs> back. Well, a proxy. But, that, but, it, but if there's another signal, that, yeah. that, that, then, then that makes sense. Well, we're talking about predictive analytics, and yeah. we, right? And how do you predict things based on people's past behavior? So I, I actually, it, you know, most of us are creatures of habit, but you know, we see- Aruba for with, 13 years. Yeah, uh, yeah. Um, we, we see going to, you know, w with, we see the data, right? We can make recommendations. We understand what people typically, you know, what they're interested in. And we see you can change behavior. You certainly sure. can change behaviors with offers. But I think there's also the macro predictive analytics. As you said, with some of the things we do with like Chipotle, which is the understand, okay, E. coli come, you know, they have the E. coli scare. What happens? You have the second E. coli scare. What happens? That's the right. stuff where we're able to correlate that, you know, because we have a big enough sample size, uh, sales, you know, ultimate sales data based on those foot traffic trends. So I think we're talking about a hyper, everything from a hyper-local level to big-scale analytics and making business decisions that, you know, that's the type sure. of stuff we sell to hedge funds. And one proxy for deciding the moments when you might be impressionable versus when, you know, you're jumping on that conference call and no matter what the offer is, you're not going to do it. One proxy for that might be measuring the past behaviors where you were actually influenced in some way and tracking that. Um, so it's those data sets, it's the flight data, I think it's just kind of you know, where we're all going with aggregating other data sets and in, in artificial intelligence. So on that future looking note, I think we're already over time, so thank you. Please join me in thanking the panel.